My name is uh, Don McCaskill, and uh, I teach in the Indigenous Studies Department at Trent University uh, in Peterborough, Ontario. Uh, the Department of Indigenous Studies at Trent is the oldest and I think still the largest department of its kind in Canada. We started in uh, 1969, and it was called the Indian Eskimo Studies Program. In 1972, uh, which is when I came on, uh, we changed the name to Department of Native Studies. And then in the 1990s, we changed it to the Department of Indigenous Studies. So I've been uh, teaching in Indigenous Studies now for 46 years. So I've seen a lot of changes that have happened in Indigenous education, both here and across the, the country. So in terms of the Indigenous Studies Department, we we have, right from the very beginning, in the early 1970s, we had uh, three pillars that started the, uh, that were fundamental to the department. One was we wanted to have a strong academic uh, program, which was challenging to students, like any other academic discipline. And then the second two pillars were different from other academic programs. One was that we wanted to be applied. That is, we wanted to reflect the indigenous community that meant that we wanted to get our students involved with the Indigenous community, and we wanted to get the Indigenous community involved uh, with us. So that got manifested by a number of different courses. So we had practicum field placement courses where students would earn credits to going into Indigenous organizations or Indigenous communities and working and getting course credit. It also, uh, we also had a lot of guest speakers that came here. We were involved in almost every major uh, indigenous uh, political and social movement in Canada. So we, for example, were involved in the mercury pollution issue in the Wabagoon English River system, affecting the, um, the communities in northwestern Ontario. Uh, we had speakers from Japan come in that talked about Minamata disease, which is the result of ingesting food uh, that has too much mercury on it. Uh, we were involved in the Mackenzie Valley Pipeline uh, debate. We had Peter Berger here from the Berger Inquiry and a number of, uh, of people from the Northwest Territories talking about that. During the, uh, the James Bay Hydroelectric Development Project, we had uh, the guest speakers down here like Billy Diamond and the lawyers and talking uh, about that project. We were involved with the Kenora um, sit-in on the, uh, the park that was uh, claimed in, as Indigenous land. Wounded Knee, we were involved in Wounded Knee back in the 1970s, the original Wounded Knee. And so we were involved in a lot of things that uh, strengthened the applied side of the, uh, uh, the program. And the applied side also, we were the first group, I think, in Canada that had uh, a, a council made up of people from outside the community, outside the university. So elders, traditional people, uh, chiefs and counselors, people from the PTOs were all involved in what we call the Council of Directors. And they were involved in all the decision making in the department, including uh, curriculum, what curriculum courses we established, what um, uh, even hiring of all of the different faculty members. And uh, so that uh, we slowly grew as a department. So that was the that was the applied side of the department. We wanted to reflect the indigenous uh, the indigenous reality and get our students involved in, in different projects. The third pillar was um, the cultural side, which we're calling now indigenous knowledge. We wanted to ground our, our program in the traditional indigenous culture. So right from the very beginning, we had something that no other university had and, and even has up until this day, that is elders that were appointed as uh, tenure track faculty with the understanding that their traditional knowledge that they had in terms of the language, in terms of the relationship to the land, the ceremonies, was the equivalent to the PhD in the Western knowledge point of view. And so they were uh, uh, appointed as tenure track faculty we had an Anishinaabe elder, Fred Wheatley, back in the 70s, and we had uh, a Cayuga elder, who was a chief in the Longhouse uh, Confederacy, uh, Jake Thomas. And then uh, later, we had two other elders, uh, Shirley Williams and Edna Manitowabi, who were also appointed as tenure-track fac tenure faculty. Um, and um, so that was the, the, and the cultural side, we also had uh, elders come here for, sometimes as many as a week or so, and we performed ceremonies such as sweat lodge ceremonies, pipe ceremonies, 
Um, and uh, then we also, the biggest thing of all in terms of the cultural pillar was the elders gathering that we had at Trent. We started the elders gathering back in the mid 1970s and uh, we were able to bring maybe 20 or 30 elders down for the conference. And we had about uh, maybe 12 different drums. We had 75 uh, people selling arts and crafts uh, here. And it just became so big during all the way from the 70s to the 80s that we had 5,000 people attending the conference. They were coming from all over Canada. It was very famous and uh, we had to uh, use the, uh, the biggest venue in all of Peterborough, the Memorial Center, to hold the conference. And it got to the point where it was so big, it was taking up so much of our time right from September on that we actually had to stop it and make it smaller in the preceding years. But so we taught the languages, we taught the, the, the traditional culture, and we developed um, all sorts of cultural courses and again got the students involved in the community in terms of uh, ceremonies. And most important of all, we had elders involved in the, in the program right from the beginning. So those were the three pillars, the academic, the uh, applied, and the uh, cultural, and we've continued that right through until today. Coming into the program, their objectives in, in the old days, back in the 70s and 80s, I think, were to learn about being Indigenous um, because of the exposure that they had to the elders, to the, uh, to the uh, getting involved with the communities and the organizations. They really reinforced their identity as Indigenous people. So we felt that <coughs> throughout our entire history, we really feel that one of the contributions that we've made is the, to strengthen the Indigenous identity in terms of the individual student, but also in terms of uh, the, the culture as well. We felt in some ways we've made some contributions to the, to the communities uh, through our research, through uh, being involved in sitting on boards, uh, involved in various issues. Um, so we like to think that there's a reciprocal relationship between the department and the community so that when the students leave, and they uh, they take they take positions outside the university. We 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 hope that they have a solid grounding in all three of those aspects of the program: the a solid academic program, so that they can think critically, synthesize material, analyze material. We hope that they uh, have a, an understanding of the processes that happen within the indigenous community, what makes an organization uh, function, an indigenous organization, and also a grounding in the uh, traditional culture. So that uh, a lot of our graduates have gone on to uh, work in government, work in the band councils. We've had a number of graduates go on to be chiefs of their, uh, their bands, their First Nations communities. We've had a lot of teachers, we've produced lawyers, we've produced uh, a lot of generations all across Canada when I travel doing research or whatever, I run into uh, Trent Indigenous Studies graduates. And so a lot of the leaders uh, that took their place in the Indigenous communities, uh, some of them were really proud to say are graduates of Indigenous Studies at Trent. Success for, uh, say, a student in the uh, graduating from the PhD program at Trent is, is a little different from that, that an undergraduate growing. And I should mention that one of the things that we developed was the first uh, PhD program in Indigenous Studies in Canada. So for a, a PhD graduate, we feel that uh, because the program is grounded in Indigenous knowledge, they should come out of the program with a real solid understanding of traditional culture, uh, particularly Anishinaabe and Haudenosaunee cultures, because those are the territories that we're, we're the most closely related to. Uh, also, of course, having a solid uh, academic uh, understanding of uh, particular issues that they do their dissertations on, um, so that the core course of the PhD program is um, a culture course. Well, that exposes students to the traditional teachings and elders and and the tradition some and some processes in that course are on the land where we take students out onto say for example sugar bushing maple syrup uh, making and those kinds of things um, so we hope that the students have a graduating from that program have a solid grounding both in in, in traditional culture and an understanding of that Plus we have a, in addition to uh, the Mazu, an option that we have that the students can take, which is uh, required, is they have to be involved with an elder or traditional people. They also have to take a practicum field placement. So that's the practical side, the applied side, and hopefully they have an understanding of the traditional. So 
uh, traditional um, indigenous organizations or indigenous cultures or indigenous communities, depending on where they do their, their work. <clears throat> so they have to do not only a, a, an oral comprehensive, I mean a written comprehensive exam, but they also have to do an oral comprehensive exam too, based on traditional uh, culture. So those are the skills that we hope to have for graduates of the, the PhD program, and we've been quite successful in uh, having students become tenure-track faculty within Indigenous Studies departments all across the country, mm -hmm. so, that, uh, so that we've had, a, I think, a pretty good record, because there's been a real need for Indigenous and Indigenous Studies uh, graduates from PhD programs to become professors within universities across Canada. For undergraduates, it's, it's somewhat similar. There are different streams, and we developed, for example, an Indigenous Environmental Studies stream that uh, is now becoming recognized throughout Canada as one of the premier programs uh, of its kind. Um, we also have a, an Indigenous Performance Program as well, and uh, that, again, is, is graduating students that have gone into various kinds of performances, whether it's dance or whether it's... Uh, uh, music or, or, or different uh, careers within within uh, the, the performing arts. So the, for an undergraduate, again, it's important that they have some understanding of, of being able to uh, uh, read and write critically and also have some understanding of the issues that have faced Indigenous people, including the, the uh, reinterpretation of Indigenous history in Canada so that they understand the, the true nature of the, the, the treaties, the residential school experiences, and those things. And they also have some grounding in the traditional understanding of, of the culture and, and also some of the key contemporary issues that, uh, that, are, that are facing Indigenous people now. Well, as I mentioned, the, uh, the Indigenous Environmental Studies program has been recognized now as, as an excellent program. It's being, uh, the, the faculty involved there are being asked to go to other universities to set up programs similar. Um, and it's also having a, uh, an important contribution, I think, for helping non-Indigenous people understand the in, in environment from the Indigenous point of view based on the Indigenous uh, worldview. And so we've had a number of uh, key indigenous environmental uh, individuals involved in setting the program up and uh, continuing their involvement with it. And we've also, it's cross-listed with the uh, environmental studies program at Trent generally, and that program is a very strong program as well. So in terms of, of water, our students, uh, for example, uh, take, participate a lot in the water walk um, and have an understanding of the uh, the blending of, of Western traditional scientific knowledge and indigenous environmental knowledge. And, and it's had a major impact on even policy with regard to them, say the Ministry of uh, Natural Resources. There's a whole series of partnerships now that are, that are happening with indigenous people working with the environmental scientists uh, in what, for example, water quality or um, forestry or a number of, of different things like that. Uh, so that, that has been a, certainly a, a source of excellence. I think we've also been very lucky in having uh, Mari Mumford, who was uh, well-renowned as a, an individual in the Indigenous performance. Uh, she worked in BAM, for example, with the BAM Centre there. She, she worked at the University of Toronto, and now she's been here a number of years, and she's established an um, Indigenous performance program. And that's had a huge impact as well in terms of the quality uh, program. And again, we've had students graduate from that program that have gone on to do things. She's also brought schools uh, in here, uh, young people to learn about Indigenous uh, performance. Uh, we have the, uh, an Indigenous theatre here, the Noseum Theatre, which is one of the few Indigenous theatres in Canada. So she's been able to use that to, uh, to kind of spread the, uh, the understanding of Indigenous performance all across the Southern Ontario region and beyond. So that's another area of, I think, excellence. And then just generally the Indigenous Studies Department, um, graduating a lot of um, individuals. Over the years, we've had a master's program as well, and we've had a lot of graduates there. Uh, and uh, the PhD program, as I mentioned, is, uh, I think, a source of real pride for us. It's one of the few PhD programs that is grounded in Indigenous knowledge and, and the traditional worldview. Uh, so those are some of the things that uh, I think we're quite proud of in the uh, department. Well, I think the, uh, the, the, 
the, the vision for the next 10 years, um, obviously more and more Indigenous students coming to post-secondary education and graduating and making a contribution to their communities, establishing Indigenous organizations of all kinds, uh, political organizations, uh, arts organizations, law and justice, uh, producing more and more Indigenous lawyers, more academics, more teachers um, in every field. And, and that's been happening for about the past um, 20 years uh, or more here. And more and more now, uh, Indigenous people are taking over the roles uh, and, and it's becoming much more normalized to uh, involve Indigenous people. Uh, as partners in any kind of initiative. You see that in the environmental area, you see that in uh, developing curriculum in the schools. I think one of the, the major stimuluses for that has been the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Uh, I think that the non-Indigenous society has finally come to recognize that uh, Indigenous people need to be involved in uh, anything that relates to them. And uh, so that the PTOs, the Provincial Territorial Organizations, such as the Union of Ontario Indians, uh, have been around for literally close to 50 years now. And they're now making huge inroads in terms of nation-to-nation uh, -nation status, for example. The provincial government has made a commitment to recognize that. Um, honoring the treaties in a, in a more substantial way than has, than has been the case in the past. Um, I think that's going to happen more and more. The partnerships between Indigenous and non-Indigenous people, uh, the fact that any, uh, any uh, development on Indigenous land has to have major uh, input from Indigenous communities. And some of our graduates have made contributions in terms of being lawyers, for example, to uh, negotiate some of those land claim deals. Uh, some of the resource development uh, deals that have been made in terms of mining or whatever. So the old days of being able to develop uh, projects, uh, for example, resource extraction, without involving Indigenous people is, are gone now and there's more. And that's going to happen more and more, I think, in the future. The other thing that's happening now, just at the beginning, and I think is going to continue to happen, is the fact that uh, Indigenous people are going to profit from uh, developments taking place on their land. So for example, Hydro One in Ontario has negotiated a deal where the indigenous communities will control the hydro line that goes through their land and they will get the, the profits from that the electricity that's being produced by that uh, land, that, that the electricity that is uh, sold. And so therefore there's a, a huge economic uh, advancement for uh, indigenous people. So economically, I think there's going to be a substantial uh, increase in the next 10 years of Indigenous people benefiting from, from the, the economy. I think that um, there's going to be a lot more Indigenous graduates that are going to get a better jobs so that the uh, economically successful, if you want to call it the middle class of Indigenous people, is going to grow and grow and become much more, much more successful.